Welcome, everyone. I'm Martin Parks, and I am honored to be your worship associate today. We are grateful for you all and for your presence this morning. We would especially like to welcome any of you who have joined our community since the beginning of the pandemic and encourage all of you to say hello using the live chat feature on our YouTube splash page or by joining our virtual coffee hour page on Facebook anytime, 24-7. As a congregation, our mission is powerful. We are a welcoming community, freely seeking intellectual and spiritual growth. We strive to create a larger community of peace, justice, and love together. Each of us is encouraged to grow spiritually in fellowship, not only by joining together in worship, but by participating actively in opportunities that offer education, discussion, and reflection. We try to do this all in the spirit of love and acceptance, reaching out and online to offer mutual support in these days of separation. Please plan to spend a few moments later today or later this week checking out our website at uunaples.org or our email notices providing links to a growing number of educational and fellowship opportunities. It's time for our annual Holiday Giving Tree project, 
In past years, we fulfilled wish lists for local school children by selecting gift tags from our holiday tree. This season, however, due to the pandemic and the church being closed, we will have be having a virtual giving tree. The families that we will be supporting this year are from Avalon and Shadowlawn Elementary Schools in Naples and the Middle School in Immokalee. Please note the information in this morning's news blast or on the website and plan to donate to what co continues to be a wonderful way for us to give back to our local community. And now, let's all sit back, take a deep breath, and settle ourselves into our time of worship. Do not leave your cares at the door. Do not leave them there when you come into this place. Be open to forgiveness and transformation. Come on in, you are welcome here. And do not leave your cares at the door. Oh, bring your pain and sorrow and joy. There's a place for them upon the altar of life. Be open to forgiveness and transformation. Come on in, you are welcome here. And do not leave your cares at the door. This is a place of grace. Of losing and finding our way up on the winding road. Meeting and parting, stumbling and starting over. Our opening words this morning are from Gretchen Haley, part of the ministry team at Foothills Unitarian Church in Fort Collins, Colorado. Gretchen admits to an audacious ambition for the liberal church, believing in its capacity to transform lives and inspire courageous love. Surrender to this life. Give up the fight for some other moment, some other life than here and now. Give up the longing for some other world, the wishing for other choices to make, other songs to sing, other bodies, other ages, other countries, other stakes. Purge the past, forgive the future, for each come too soon. Surrender, surrender only to this life, this day, this hour. Not because it doesn't constantly break your heart, but because it also beckons with beauty, startles with delight. If only we keep waking up. This is the gift we have been given. These body clothes, this heartbreak, this pulse, this breath, 
this light, these friends, this hope. Here, we remember ourselves, giving thanks together. Now, please join me in our chalice lighting response. May this flame stir our hearts and remind us of our mission to be truly welcoming, to grow in mind and spirit, and to widen the circle of peace, justice, and love. We are grateful to have one of UUCGN's affiliate ministers filling our pulpit this morning, the Reverend Roger C. Grugel. Roger is an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister, having graduated from Meadville Lombard Theological School in 2013 with a Master of Divinity degree. Prior to his ordination, Roger earned his Juris Doctorate from the University of North Dakota and practiced law for the Minnesota Family Farm Law Project for nearly 25 years, representing financially distressed family farmers in danger of losing their farms. After graduating from seminary, Roger has worked as a chaplain for Abau Hospice and then at Moorings Park, first as a chaplain there and then as the director of chaplain services. He is currently the palliative care chaplain for Naples Community Hospital and is married to the Reverend Jennifer S. Dant, staff chaplain at Naples Community Hospital. He has three stepchildren, Macy, Marina, and Jack, as well as a cat, Luna, and two dogs, Frankie and Izzy. Roger is one of UUCGN's three affiliated community ministers, the others being the Reverend Jennifer Dant and the Reverend Suzanne Fast. The work of community ministers is a vital part of our Unitarian Universalist mission of active participation in the world. Community ministers might work as chaplains in hospitals, hospices, at prisons, on campuses, in police departments, or in the military. They might be the spiritual directors, pastoral counselors, street ministers, social justice advocates, or UU legislative ministers. They frequently serve as educators, journalists, UUA field staff, arts ministers, or nonprofit administrators. The work they do makes a difference and extends UU principles and values further into our world. Welcome, Roger. We are looking forward to your reflections and comments related to covenant and practicing forgiveness in Unitarian Universalism. But now, Let's gather into our centering hymn, 
How Could Anyone, led this morning by its author, singer-songwriter Libby Roderick. Even at a distance, ours is a welcoming community where we find connection, a spiritual community where we find meaning, a sharing community where our joys are amplified, and a caring community where our sorrows are lessened. We set aside this time each week, even when we are not together in person, to share th those things which are either weighing on our minds or are, li are lifting us up. If you have a personal joy or concern, we invite you now to light a flame or to speak aloud the name or names of those in joy or sorrow that you carry in your heart. Let's also take this moment to acknowledge the realities of how the pandemic continues to affect our lives. Those who are ill with the virus, those who have lost a loved one, or those who serve on the front lines to help and to serve others, we hold them in our hearts. These joys and sorrows, spoken and unspoken, weave us together in the fabric of our community. In joy or in sorrow, we do not walk alone. And now, this morning's meditation. As we gather in our homes, in front of our computer screens and our TVs, may we be fully present in this moment. May we forget about, at least for a moment, all the busyness of our world and concentrate on this moment, because this is the only moment we have. May we take a deep breath in, exhale, and meditate on this day and our lives. And we will follow that with 30 seconds of silent meditation.
Our first reading today is entitled Forgiveness by Amanda Udis Kessler. It may be the hardest thing we will ever do. Caught up in our self-righteousness, honing our pain. The one who offended may not deserve forgiveness. And we are not obliged to offer it. Why, then, should we forgive? Because we have all caused pain. Because we all miss the mark. Because we can deepen our souls if we forgive. Because restoring even one relationship heals many hearts. Because we would be forgiven ourselves. Because drawing closer to one another builds our communities. Because the alternative is endless bitterness. Because the world we seek to create is a world filled with forgiveness. Because we need not remain caught up in our self-righteousness and pain. It may be the hardest thing we will ever do. Let us, Let us take, take the, first the first step now. The time has come for us to express our ongoing gratitude for this community, its work, its vision, and all the ways in which it nourishes our lives, from its welcoming doors and sheltering walls to its good and generous people, from the sanctuary of its memorial garden to its outreach in the wider community. For all these things and for the ways it is significant to your life, this morning offering for the ongoing mission of this congregation is gratefully received. Please consider making a contribution today by mail, and you can find our address on the UU Naples uh, website at uunaples.org. Our second reading today is entitled Forgiveness, A Very Good Understanding of Forgiveness 
by Tefwadza Hondawa Mugari. One of my teachers had each of us bring a clear plastic bag and a sack of potatoes. For every person we'd refuse to forgive in our life, we were told to choose a potato. Write, it, write on it the name and date and put it in a plastic bag. Some of our bags, as you can imagine, were quite heavy. We were then told to carry this bag with us everywhere for one week, putting it beside our bed at night, on the seat when driving, next to our desk at work. The hassle of lugging this around with us made it clear what a weight we were carrying spiritually and how we had to pay attention to it all the time and to not forget and keep leaving it in embarrassing places. Naturally, the conditions of the potatoes de deteriorated to a nasty slime. This was a great metaphor for the price we pay for keeping our pain and heavy negativity. Too often we think of forgiveness as a gift to the other person. And while that's true, it's clearly also a gift for ourselves. So the next time you decide you can't forgive someone, ask yourself, isn't my bag heavy enough? It is good to be with you this morning. Uh, it has been too long, and I'm so happy to be among my friends here uh, at this lovely congregation, the Unitarian Universalist Church of Greater Naples. Uh, I hope I'm able to come back to you sooner in the future. Elmo Patrick Sonier was convicted for the rape and murder of Loretta Ann Bork, 18, and the murder of David LeBlanc, 17, and sentenced to death. While on death row at Louisiana State Prison, Sonier was contacted by an outreach effort setting up communication with inmates on death row. Sister Helen Prejean, a Catholic nun, was assigned to him. After they started corresponding, she began to visit him and became his spiritual advisor. He was the first of many death row inmates whom she counseled. She eventually wrote Dead Man Walking in 1993, a book about her experiences and her belief that the death penalty was morally wrong. The following is an excerpt from Dead Man Walking. Lloyd LeBlanc has told me he would have been content with imprisonment for Patrick Sonier. He went to the execution, he says, not for revenge, but hoping for an apology. Patrick Sonier had not disappointed him. Before sitting in the electric chair, he had said, Mr. LeBlanc, I want to ask for your forgiveness for what me and Eddie done. And Lloyd LeBlanc had nodded his head, signaling a forgiveness he had already given. He says that when he arrived with the sheriff's deputies there in the cane field to identify his son, he had knelt by his boy, laying down there with his two little eyes sticking out like bullets, and prayed the Our Father. And when he came to the words, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, he had not altered or equivocated. And he said, whoever did this, I forgive them. But he acknowledges that it's a struggle to overcome the feelings of bitterness and revenge that well up, especially as he remembers David's birthday year by year and loses him all over again. David at 20. David at 25, David getting married, David standing at the back door with his little ones clustered around his knees, grown up David, a man like himself whom he will never know. Forgiveness is never going to be easy. Each day it must be prayed for and struggled for and won. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary Online Edition defines forgive briefly as to cease to feel resentment, to give up resentment without claim to compensation. A very brief and succinct definition, 
suggesting in its brevity an uncomplicated, straightforward, perhaps even easy process. How tough can this be? Just give up your claim of resentment. Sounds simple, right? Well, if it's so simple, why is there so little forgiveness in this present world? If it's so easy, why do I sometimes feel this overpowering resentment towards my high school guidance counselor, who's been dead for 20 years, who in 1977 said I wasn't smart enough to get through law school? No, forgiveness is not easy for me, nor do I suspect it's easy for many of you. Each day, as Sister Helen Prejean says, it must be prayed for and struggled for and won. Forgiveness is an essential quality not for just individuals, but also for the maintenance of healthy religious communities as well. For Jewish communities, Rosh Hashanah is the start of the Jewish High Holy Days, which end with Yom Kippur. It is the beginning of the 10 days of repentance, during which Jews focus on expiating their sins and achieving reconciliation with God. Jewish congregations spend the eve of Yom Kippur and the following day in prayer and meditation. And they ask them forgiveness from one another for their past offenses on the evening of Yom Kippur, since obtaining forgiveness from others signifies God's forgiveness. God is believed to forgive the sins of those who sincerely repent and show their repentance by improved behavior and the performance of good deeds. I was raised Roman Catholic, and forgiveness was also part of that religious culture, woven into the fabric of my faith through intentional rituals. Whether it be praying the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, or going to confession and saying the act of contrition and praying the words, O my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee. All of which was a liberating process that gave me a spiritual fresh start, a new moral slate to begin my week. Unitarian Universalists, to my knowledge, have no similar ritual or service pertaining to forgiveness comparable to the Jewish high holidays or Catholic confession. Forgiveness is not explicitly mentioned in either our principles or the living tradition from which we draw spiritual support. Unitarian Universalists also don't have a developed theology of forgiveness, all of which I think is unfortunate for our religious communities. Perhaps it is our positive understanding of the divine and human nature that has inhibited a theology and practice of forgiveness. As as Universalist minister Thomas Starr King once said, Universalists believe God is too good to damn them, and the Unitarians believe they're too good to be damned by God. If that's the case, perhaps we don't need a theology of forgiveness. But I think we do, and here's why. Unitarian Universalist communities do not require people to affirm a shared creed, doctrine, or theology in order to become members. Our communities are largely self-governing and autonomous, and in the final analysis, behold them to no one, not even the Unitarian Universalist Association. Yes, we have our principles and sources, but they are not a shared creed. They do not prescribe a religious outcome or determine membership. As a result, Unitarian Universalists are one of the most diverse, individualistic, and localized religions in the country. All of which begs the question, what actually holds us together? What holds this group of rugged, free-thinking individuals with no supreme theology and no centralized governing system together? What keeps us in community? My answer is our covenants. Our covenants are about being together 
and staying together. Covenants are promises that govern our interactions when we are gathered together as a community and are expressed in a variety of ways. There are express covenants contained in our eight principles where we promise to affirm and promote the values of our faith, like compassion, justice, love, and interdependence. You, the members of UUCGN, have your own rather extensive congregational covenants, including in part, and I'm just going to quote a few of them in part, to build an atmosphere of love, respect, and concern to care for one another with loving kindness, and to heal wounded relationships. All of these are express covenants. But according to Reverend Peter Friedrichs, our movement also has implied covenants, our unstated, inferred promises we make to each other, the ones that aren't captured in any written statement or recited in unison on Sunday Sunday mornings. These hold no less power than the written ones. Although they're implied, they might be tougher to notice. Chief among them is an implied covenant to forgive. And why are covenants to forgive so important in our church settings? Because a covenant to forgive is foundational to our mission as a movement. And I believe our mission as a movement is to build the beloved community. Beloved communities are characterized as welcoming, supportive places of peace, love, healing, and abundance, where everyone has their basic physical needs met, but also places where our emotional and spiritual needs for love, acceptance, and support are met also. Beloved communities are steeped in right relationship that provide the balm for spiritual healing and growth that can come only from healthy, vibrant communities. The goals of beloved community are as lofty as they are difficult to achieve. And because we are fallible human beings, we will fail many, many times. That's why, whether it's expressed or implied, a communal covenant of forgiveness and, if possible, reconciliation is so important. Our opening hymn, Come, Come, Whoever You Are, is based on the Rumi poem, which promises a spiritual home for the wanderer, the worshiper, and the lover of leaving. It seems like it was written for Unitarian Universalists. Rumi knew how hard it would be to build such a diverse, inclusive community. So he added the words, which are missing from our hymn, Though you've broken your vow a thousand times. Though you've broken your vow a thousand times. These words stress the importance of forgiveness and reconciliation for communities, Spiritual practices that provide the lubricant, the organizational, if you will, spiritual WD-40 that prevents the mechanisms of our communities from getting gummed up or accumulating the hurt feelings of emotional rust and resentment and injury. Feelings that breed anger and the need for retribution, what produces conflict and harms communities. We see this in some of our congregations, where boorish behavior and unhealthy conflict lead to members leaving, or even splits and schisms in our churches. Forgiveness and reconciliation, on the other hand, fosters understanding, compassion, and trust that promotes healthy communities. What might that look like in our churches and communities? When we hurt someone, we apologize for our behavior, even if we didn't intend to hurt anyone. It requires us not to substitute our own judgment or sensibilities for those of the person we have hurt, 
but instead to be committed to the working, learning, and growing spiritually so we are less likely to make the same mistake again. As for the aggrieved party, we covenant with each other to accept good faith attempts at reconciliation that will open ourselves up to the possibility that the relationship can not only be just repaired, but the relationship can move to deeper depths of understanding and growth. But please remember, forgiveness really is a choice. No one can force us to forgive. And let me be clear, I'm not suggesting that people who have been injured by others should always put themselves at risk of being injured again, especially when the injury is physical, sexual, emotional abuse, or behavior that violates a legal or ethical standard. Also, forgiveness is not about condoning the hurtful behavior. In some cases, forgiveness may be granted, but reconciliation cannot and should not be pursued. The key to repentance is authenticity and a commitment to not continuing harm in the future. Unfortunately, not everyone will offer this. As Unitarian Universalists, each day we promise to strive to create the beloved community we need. As fallible human beings, we know we will fall short, that at times our reach will exceed our grasp, and we will hurt others in the process. Each day we are called to account for our actions and how we treat others, and each day we are asked to do better. As we attempt to do better, may the wounds of, beloved, of building beloved communities be healed by the abundant and generous balm of forgiveness. Shalom, amen, and blessed be. Our closing this morning is adapted from words by UU Minister Maureen Killeran. No matter how isolated or how exhausted we may feel, we each have gifts that can make a difference in the world. In this coming week, may we do at least one thing to support the broken, to welcome the stranger even at a distance, to celebrate what is worthy, and to do the work of peace, justice, and love. And the benediction is from our own Reverend Tony Fisher. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all beings. And have a wonderful day. <laughs>